Welcome to July Said News, or Dan for short. My name is Rob, and today I want to talk to you about is uh, an amazing thing just happened. That is that uh, individuals are actually agreeing on crypto regulation in a way. So we'll take a look at our first story as uh, Vitalik Buterin, head of uh, Ethereum Foundation, Sam Bakeman fried CEO of FTX, and Gary Gensler, head of uh, the SEC, actually look like they might be agreeing on regulation. Also, there's some more good news, how uh, institutions are getting ready to get into crypto a little bit more, and uh, this is a surprising reason why they're not. And then lastly, we'll talk about how Visa, PayPal, Western Union, in and out Takis and Formula One file for crypto patents. And before we jump into the big story, you may notice that uh, we are not in the regular background. We're not in Texas. We're back home in Puerto Rico. Unfortunately, our house uh, has no electricity. So we are here in one of our uh, investment properties. And you may hear us. The guys are working, doing some construction, construction in the back. So if there's uh, some large banging, I apologize. But let's jump right in to the main story. This, is what good, this was a good story by Decrypt and talking about how Vitalik wants to uh, not rush into institutional capital. And it's a good article, but that's not the big story. The big story for me was just how I didn't know that uh, Vitalik was actually on board with, you know, a little bit of, of uh, regulation. And he's actually broken it up uh, quite simply into two buckets. One is to provide consumer protection. The other one is to uh, stem the flow of illicit activities into crypto. He goes, these are the two things. He's, uh, and I got to tell you, I, I have no problems with consumer protection. Uh, the, the question is, because some, some individual retail investors will spend a little bit and they'll lose it all. And I got to tell you, losing all your money is a, is a great education tool. And uh, some people lose uh, their entire life savings. For us here at Digital Asset News, we try to do a lot of teaching before people lose too much. And we try to get the information out there as best as possible. However, some people are just a bunch of gamblers. And uh, one of the problems that, uh, as far as like illicit activities, uh, Vitalik is talking about here, it all stemmed from a Sam Bakeman fried uh, post where he talked about how he wanted KYC and AML for DeFi. I think that's ridiculous. And Vitalik summed it up quite simply here. He goes, look, KYC and AML are, are used by financial institutions to prevent money laundering, fraud, and corruption. That's fine. However, the retail, people like you and me, if they have to, you know, they'll be forced to, then they'll do the KYC and AML. But guess what? The hackers won't do KYC and AML. So why would you do that? That makes absolutely no sense. And I got to agree with him here. And actually, SBF or Sam Bakeman agrees with him uh, the exact same way. And then moving down, there are DeFi regulations that Buren thinks could be more helpful. And these three, I got to agree with him such as limits on the amount of leverage a user can trade with. Now you can see underneath here, there's rules right underneath me. And the rules are what protect me. And I try to abide by those as much as possible. One, when I say it's all gone, it means don't invest more than you can afford to lose. If you think that everything's gone, you won't spend too much. Next one is everything's a scam. Everything's a scam until proven otherwise. Remember that you'll be a lot safer. Also, no exchanges. Don't leave any of your crypto on exchanges. There are a lot of things going on about FTX and Sam Bankman Freed and whatever's going on, I'm not for sure. But if you don't feel comfortable, take it off your exchanges. There's a reason why uh, you have a ledger or a tracer for cold storage. Also, no leverage. I don't use leverage and uh, you can do whatever you want to. But for me, you can take a look at all the different uh, leverage positions that get, that get liquidated and people lose a lot of money. And also take profits along the way because nobody ever went broke taking profits. These are the rules that I live by. You can decide for yourself what are best for you. So, on this one, if we take a look at that first part, of course, no leverage or limited leverage. Second part, transparency and code audits. I think this would be very big for the DeFi protocols as we can take a, as they audit their code and they can say, these are the things that we are looking into. These are things that work and don't work. And this is what, how we protect you because we have lost $2.6 billion in DeFi protocols alone. And the reason why is they say it was a problem with the code. I am suspicious that maybe it's just an exit scam, but that's just me. And the last one is requiring knowledge-based tests as opposed to, they say, plutocratic net worth minimum rules, or uh, these are accredited investors. So look, we've talked about this numerous times in the channel. Accredited investors, they get the run on the ICOs. They get a run on all the different great opportunities that are out there, which you don't get involved into because you don't make a million dollars plus a year or $200,000 in the bank or whatever it is for the accredited investor. However, 
if you could just take a test and say, look, I know exactly what I'm getting into. I know exactly what I'm investing. I can take this test. I can prove that I know this. So let me do my thing. I totally agree with that. I think that has to be in place because a little bit too much uh, people lose uh, their, their crypto because there's these disclosures and disclaimers that are not made available. I think people get a little bit uh, ahead of themselves and they invest too much in things that uh, really uh, weren't very transparent, Celsius. So on top of that, the next argument people would say is, well, Rob, I can go to down, to the, down the street to the casino and I can gamble my life savings away. True. However, the casinos still are pretty heavily regulated. This is what I'm talking about. Did you know that the SEC oversees parts of casino gaming? So this is from the SEC website. The ownership and operation of casino entertainment facilities are subject to pervasive regulation of the laws, rules, and regulations of each of the jurisdictions in which we operate. Gaming laws are based upon declarations of public policy designed to ensure that gaming is conducted honestly, competitively, and free of criminal and corruptive elements. Trust me. If the casinos want to take every dime from you, they will. And thankfully, there's a little bit of uh, regulation in place. And it's not just the SEC. You got the Nevada Gaming Com Commission, state gaming commissions that over overlook them and make sure that they're on the up and up and not scamming and stealing from uh, all their patrons. So I understand the argument. I can go down and gamble it away. Well, you can, but just know the casinos are also regulated too. It's just the lay of the land. So on top of all this that we're talking about, this was just Vitalik. So to talk about Sam Bakeman Freed, he responds to Buren's points. And he says, you know what? Those are pretty reasonable. And he expressed an openness to bringing uh, Vitalik to DC. Like he is gone and also Charles Hoskinson has gone to talk to uh, regulators and politicians. I think it's a fantastic idea, especially with the common sense that Vitalik brings. Now the whole thing ab around this is this issue with Sam Bakeman Freed and what's happening. So Sam had a Twitter thread, came out 10 days ago. And what he tried to talk about is that he is capitulating to crypto Twitter after receiving pushback on potential rules related to DeFi, such as requiring autonomous programs to comply with US sanctions. And he revised the post and said he will continue to do so. So what he's said, he's, he goes, I would like people to, for KYC and AML for DeFi. Listening to Vitalik, he goes, you know what? I'm wrong. When the facts change, I change. And I can respect the person that does that and doesn't just keep pushing forward and falls on his sword. So tip of the hat to Sam Bakeman free. Regulatory uncertainty is seen as a barrier to institutional crypto investing. And I got to agree here. And before I move on, because we're going to talk about the next part, which uh, is institutional investors and the Fidelity survey. I know people are up in arms especially with uh, this what's a commodity and what's a security, because that's under the umbrella of, of regulations that we're talking about right now. And good old Gary Gensler can agree on consumer protection, but we can't agree on is what's a security and what's a commodity. And people are afraid that Ethereum is going to be labeled as a security. And I just think to myself, what if it is? You know that this already happened. This happened actually quite easily uh, with EOS. And that is a friend of the show, Beardy's favorite... Uh, <laughs> favorite crypto. EOS already had this happen. They went to battle with the SEC over an unregistered security sale. This happened in 2019. And securities, we I deal in those all, well, once a week. It's called stocks. I buy them on Robinhood. It's not an, an issue. And Block One, uh, they went to battle with the SEC and said, okay, we raised $4.1 billion. We'll pay you $24 million in the fines. They transferred over from the ERC-20 token back to onto their own um, uh, primary block and uh, or their own chain, and that's all they had to pay, $24 million. So if this happens in the future, as far as regulation and, and Gary gets his way, all right, register him, pay some fines and move on. Let's just get going with what's happening. So that is, is that little snippet piece, but really what I want to talk about here is... is uh, this institutional investor study and what it said and i was wrong <laughs> i thought that the reason why a lot of the uh, industry or institutions were getting in was because of a lack of, lack of regulation well this study said that only 16 percent said that was the issue so what was the big issue we'll get that in a second but they did say that uh, 81 percent of the institutional investors surveyed view digital assets as having a role 
in investment portfolios. So that'll lead me to my next point, which is the good news. And it all comes from this uh, survey from Fidelity. First of all, who's Fidelity? Why should we care what they are? Well, they got a lot of money. They got four and a half trillion assets under management, just so you know. And this was a survey that just came out and said that 74% of institutional investors plan to buy crypto in the future. Well, what's the problem? What's holding them back? I'll tell you. 58% of institutional investors were invested in digital assets in the first half of 2022. It's pretty good. A 6% increase from a year before. I found that interesting because last year was the bull run and now we're in the bear market. I think if you want to say smart money, big money, whatever you want to call it, they realize that, hey, there is a lot of potential. But we, don't to, we don't want to buy it when it's at its all time high. So let's wait till things cool off. And this is the cool off period. 74% of institutions said they were planning to buy digital assets in the future. Of course, when it drops even farther. 51% of a positive perception digital assets, which is up from 45%. And then it's worth noting that the survey ended in June, which was June of this year when it was at its all-time low. I thought people, people probably think it was going to go lower. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Fidelity survey included 1,000 institutional investors spread across the U.S., Europe, and Asia. Institutional investors refer to hedge funds, financial advisors, and high net worth individuals. So really what it came down to is why aren't they getting into it? Why isn't it? Well, really what it came down to was a couple of things where it said here. So here we have the actual PDF and it talks about, look, the big reason is price volatility is the greatest overall barrier to investments reported by investor survey. So half consistent with prior years of study. And I gotta tell you over the last uh, 30, 60 days, our actual volatility is less and what we see in the S&P 500 as NASDAQ. So maybe this will be one of those things that the institutions can look at and go, you know what? This is actually looking a lot better. And there might be a asymmetrical bet or a far greater upside as time goes on. The other concerns, lack of fundamentals to gauge appropriate values, concerns around security, like we just talked about, market manipulation. Well, it's very easy to, to manipulate this market because we're under a trillion dollars. I mean, that's just the, super, the simplest thing of all time. And also, you can see that in precious metals, they manipulate that as well. And gold is a market cap of $12 trillion. So what can you do? Concerns around regulatory classification of certain coins that are securities. Now, this one says 33%, which makes a lot more sense to me. Anyway, you put all this together. That's one of those things that, that they say we're not too sure about that right now. But I got to tell you, it's a step in the right direction. I think as time goes on, the institutions, nobody wants to be the first, but nobody wants to be the last. Anyhow, on that piece, we're going to finish up also on some news and a little bit of uh, the institutions. BNY Mellon, America's oldest bank and one of the more crypto-friendly institutions, said earlier this month that select institutional clients will be able to hold and transfer Bitcoin and Ether through its new crypto custody offering. We know about this. This has already been going on. The trend is not surprising. Talia Klein, BNY Mellon's head of digital asset custody commercial product. And before we go on, why should we even care about BNY Mellon? Well, it's because it's got 42 trillion assets under custody and 1.8 trillion assets under management. Again, a lot of money. And we're seeing a lot of institutional interest. Klein said, what is prohibiting others from getting into the space? What we've seen is that people require an institutional grade provider. In a, in a research report published alongside its custody announcement, BNY Mellon reported 70% of institutional investors surveyed would increase their digital asset activity if services like custody and execution are available from recognized, trusted institutions. So just add that on to one more reason why institutions aren't getting in so much right now. But I got to tell you, where there is a necessity, where there's a demand, then all of a sudden there becomes creation. So uh, look for BNY to actually push that envelope. And that is the good news. And on top of one more which would be Apollo. Apollo holds crypto for clients as it expands in digital assets. So another uh, reputable organization that uh, is doing the custody route. First of all, who's Apollo? Why should we care? Well, they got a half a trillion assets under management. So again, they got a lot of money. Apollo holds crypto for clients. Real quick, it's the validation of this incessant drumbeat that crypto is here to stay, said Diogo Monica, president of Anchorage Digital, crypto firm that holds a national trust bank charter from the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, this is a very long-term horizon process and tech and that for the large institutions, it doesn't really matter that there is volatility short-term. So again, we can take a look at volatility, we can take a look at consumer protection and regulation, all those things, but it all adds up to one thing. And that is that institutions are coming, 
I think the people that are investing are going to do quite well as time goes on, not financial advice. I think we're in the right place at the right time. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then let's uh, finish up with Visa, PayPal, Western Union, and some great stuff that's going on as far as trademarks. So again, this just points me in the right direction that I think we're probably going to do pretty well as time moves. So according to Visa's filings, the firm is contemplating a crypto wallet, describing its software for users to view, access, store, monitor, manage, trade, send, receive, transmit, blah, 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 and NFTs. PayPal's trademark application mentions crypto 18 times, beginning with downloadable software for sending, receiving, accepting, buying, blah, 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 blah. You tokens and you utility tokens. Western Union is going bigger on digital currency. Western Union's filing for a patent appears to cover every aspect of digital payments, which they should because they are charging a, an arm and a leg for uh, all those different cross-border payments. Ridiculous. The management and maintenance of digital currency and electronic wallets like the others plans downloadable software for generating cryptographic keys for receiving spending crypto. So one thing to, to remember, and that is, uh, which is pretty big, is this. Just because we've heard about them filing patents doesn't mean they're going to do it. I have remembered covering a story six months to a year ago about Walmart, and we haven't seen much of them doing. But trademark filings are often defensive legal actions, meaning, well, I don't know what we're going to do with it yet, but we don't want you to play in our sandbox yet. They don't guarantee that the covered products and services will actually be developed and sold, but they do demonstrate a company recognizes a potential future market and wants to be prepared to enter it. So people know that it's going to be, something's going to happen. They just don't know how big it's going to be. But again, no one wants to be first, but nobody wants to be last. In October alone, Web3 and NFT filings have emerged from brands as diverse as uh, Fender, musical instrument maker, I guess, food giants Del Monte, Kraft, and Burger Chain in and out uh, Takis. Wine and Spirits Company, Hennessy, auto racing firm, Formula One, online betting platform, DraftKings, and singer Lizzo. And you can just see right here, trademark applications have been gone. And lastly, NFTs and digital goods and collectibles appear to be the hottest category. So far this year, 6,300 U.S. trademark apps have been filed for NFTs and related items compared to only 2,100 apps in all of 2021. So again, I think this is a step in the right direction. What did you think about that in the comments section? I think it's going to be big. And lastly, just to uh, sum everything up, profits, like the rules that we talked about. Don't forget to take profits. Not only does that include the things that we talk about as far as uh, in, in our traditional exchanges, if you have things in exchanges or in, or in uh, cold storage, but uh, remember, if you have a Roth IRA, like I do with iTrust, I'd like to thank also, I trust for sponsoring today's video. Just remember uh, that you can sell your crypto within your Roth IRA account and pay 0% in capital gains because it is a Roth IRA account. So you, if you take profits over here on a regular exchange, capital gains. In a Roth IRA, you can trade all day long. And guess what? You don't pay any capital gains tax. Now, you do have... Uh, a trading fee, which is uh, assessed by iTrust. That's where they make their funds or their revenue because they don't even charge a uh, monthly fee. But I just uh, a couple of days uh, have sold some of my Ethereum and I'm waiting for Ethereum to go back down. And I'll buy back in again. Again, this is uh, uh, iTrust. You can find a link in the description. It looks just like this. And you can see uh, an overview video I did about why I chose it, why I've been going strong with them for two years and um, why they're uh, doing good things, especially for my retirement account. So that's it for today. So look, I know it's a little bit long, a lot of things to go over, but if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Also consider subscribing. A lot of things to talk about are time sensitive. And that's it for today. So thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.